Welcome back everyone to this lovely new Creepy News episode. Today I wanted to share with you the case of the Lonely Hearts Killers. I can't remember if I ever did on my old channel, but whenever you have a couple that is murdering other people, it's so romantic and I wanted to share it with you today. The perpetrators were named, or actually called, Raymond Fernandez and Martha Beck. And Wikipedia they stated the following at the introduction. They were an American serial killer couple. And they were convicted of one murder, are known to have committed two more and were suspected of having killed up to 20 victims during a spree between 1947 and 1949. After their arrest and trial for serial murder in 1949, they became known as the Lonely Hearts Killers for meeting their unsuspecting victims through Lonely Hearts ads. A number of films and television shows are based on this case and today this video is also about the case on YouTube. Imagine that. What a surprise. Anyways, let's get right into this case. So they have some details here about the perpetration themselves. Let's start with Raymond, because that's how they organized it. Raymond Fernandez was born on December 17, 1914 in Hawaii to Spanish parents. Shortly thereafter, they moved to Connecticut. As an adult, he moved to Spain, married and had four children, all of whom he abandoned later in life. After serving in Spain's Merchant Marine and then British Intelligence during World War II, he decided to seek work. Shortly after boarding a ship bound for the United States, a steel hatch fell on him, fracturing his skull and injuring his frontal lobe. Now, I just want to say, it would have been better if he was killed by it, because honestly, what they did You'll, you'll get to hear it in a bit, but honestly, you, you're almost inclined to say, I wish that would have killed him right then and there. It might have saved some people's lives in the future. But this damage apparently caused him an injury that affected his social and sexual behavior. I want you to really think about it. It influenced his sexual behavior. What do you think that means? A man that has trouble with his sexual behavior can mean many things. Now, upon his release from a hospital, he stole some clothing and was subsequently imprisoned for a year, during which time his cellmate converted him to a belief in voodoo and black magic. He later claimed black magic gave him irresistible power and charm over women. This is the only thing I can confirm from personal experience. I charm women with black magic all the time. Sometimes I wake up completely sick though because it always returns to the caster. But you know, that doesn't really matter as long as you get the woman. Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> Exactly, there's a woman here. What happened? It's the black magic, man. Anyways, let's go over to Martha Beck. She was born, well, with a different name, doesn't really matter, but she was born in Milton, Florida. Allegedly due to a glandular problem, well, they say a common explanation for obesity back in the day. She was overweight and underwent puberty prematurely at a trial. She claimed to have been raped by her brother. She went on to claim that when she had told her mother what happened, her mother had beaten her, claimed that Martha was responsible. As a teen, Beck ran away from home, and in 1978, writer Truman Capote said that he had also joined her for a short time when he was 10. After Martha finished school, she studied nursing but had trouble finding a job due to her weight. She initially became an undertaker's assistant and prepared female bodies for burial. She then quit that job and moved to California, where she worked in an army hospital as a nurse. She engaged in sexually promiscuous behavior and eventually, well eventually she became pregnant. How, how sad. She tried to convince the father to marry her, but of course he refused. Single and pregnant, she returned to Florida. Yeah, sir, she right, you weirdo. She then told people the father was a serviceman she had married and later claiming he had been killed in the Pacific campaign. The town mourned her loss and the story was published in the local newspaper. Shortly after her daughter was born, she became pregnant again by a bus driver named Alfred Beck. They married quickly and divorced six months thereafter. She gave birth to a son. Unemployed and a single mother of two young children, she escaped into a fantasy world, buying romance magazines and novels and watching romantic movies. In 1946, she found employment at a hospital for children. She placed a Lonely Hearts ad in 1947, which Raymond Fernandez answered. Now this is where the story gets so romantic in a bad, bad way, but I guess to them this was romantic activities. Murdering a bunch of people, right? Well, that's what they did. Eventually, after they met, that's exactly what happened. So let's get into the juicy details. This is what they had to say about it. 
Fernandez visited back and stayed for a short time. She told everyone they were married. He returned to New York City while she had made preparations in Milton, Florida, where she lived. When she was abruptly fired from her job, she packed up and arrived on his doorstep in New York. He enjoyed the way she catered to his every whim, and when he learned she had left her children for him, he thought it was a sign of an unconditional love. This is kind of weird, just listen to this part. He confessed his criminal enterprises to Beck, who quickly sent her children to the Salvation Army in order so that she could assist him with these crimes. She posed as his little sister, giving him an air of respectability. Their victims feeling more secure knowing there was another woman in the house of an agreed to stay with the pair. Beck also convinced some victims that she lived alone and that her brother was only a guest. She was extremely jealous and went to great lengths to make sure Fernandez and his intended never consummated their relationship. When he did have sex with a woman, Beck subjected both to her violent temper. In 1949, the pair committed the three murders for which they were later convicted. Jeanette Fay, 66, became engaged to Fernandez and went to stay at his Long Island apartment. When Beck caught her in bed with Fernandez, she smashed Fay's head in with a hammer in a murderous rage. Fernandez then strangled Fay. Fay's family became suspicious when she disappeared and Fernandez and Beck fled. Beck and Fernandez traveled to Byron Center Road in Wyoming Township, Michigan, where they met and stayed with Delphine Downing, a young widow with a two-year-old daughter. On February 28th, Downing became agitated and Fernandez gave her sleeping pills to calm her down. The daughter witnessed Downing's resulting stupor and began to cry, which enraged Beck. Panicked, Beck choked the child but didn't kill her. Fernandez thought Downing would become suspicious if she saw her bruised daughter, so he shot the unconscious woman. The couple then stayed for several days in Downing's house. Again, enraged by the daughter's crying, Beck drowned her in a basin of water. They buried the bodies in the basement, but suspicious neighbors reported the Downing's disappearances, leading the police to arrive at the door on March 1st, 1949, and arrest Beck and Fernandez. Which was a good thing, as you can hear these people were absolutely crazy. You lure some people into your home, or at least you win over their trust with fake stories, all these fake stories twisting into complete insanity for the victims that have no clue of what's going on and then these people start murdering everyone in the home if you don't watch out drowning a child smashing another woman's head in with a hammer because she was jealous and angry perhaps the woman was more insane than the man i don't know they were both just as crazy that's for sure fernandez quickly confessed during the trial and the pair vehemently denied committing 17 murders that were attributed to them. And Fernandez tried to retract his confession, saying he made it only to protect Beck. Their trial was sensationalized, with lurid tales of sexual perversity. Newspaper reporters described Beck's appearance with derision, and she wrote protesting letters to the editors. Fernandez and Beck were convicted of Janet Faye's murder, the only one for which they were tried, and sentenced to death. On March 8, 1951, both were executed in the electric chair. Despite their tumultuous arguments and relationship problems, they often professed their love to each other, as demonstrated by their official last words. So Raymond Fernandez said, I want to shout it out, I love Martha. What do the public know about love? And Martha said, my story is a love story, but only those tortured by love can know what I mean. I'm not unfeeling, stupid or moronic. I'm a woman who had a great love and always will have it. Imprisonment in the death house has only strengthened my feelings for Raymond. Well, with those words we can clearly tell they were out of their minds. It just sounds so stupid to begin with. If they killed these people, they must have had a twisted idea of love. One that I want to investigate for myself in my spare time, but don't worry, I won't kill anyone. And if I do, I'll make an episode about myself. Anyways, these psychopaths are dead now, so that's good. I hope the victims are resting in peace. It's sad that that happened to those victims again, because it's a twisted story where they manipulated these victims. They were like, hoping that everything was fine. Maybe they had great dreams about being with Fernandes. Like this one woman had great dreams about being with Fernandes. She's thinking she can have a relationship with him and in comes Martha with a hammer, breaking her skull in. So weird. With that being said, 
Dear viewer, have sweet dreams.